Okay, now you don't have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle with the foe. Bring him home. Bring him home. Here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They'll have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you Sing this song, bring a home, bring a home. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring a home, bring a home. I'm not really a pacifist, bring a home, bring a home. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring a home, you find me out on the firing line, bring a home, bring a home. Even if they drop their planes to bomb, bring them home, bring them home. Though they brought helicopters and a bomb, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam, bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their fallacy. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And when in a few universal rules, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle Sam, I'm John McAuliffe. I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and the founder and director of the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Um, this is a program that we will be the first of a series of many, we hope, uh, that will document the singers, the songs, and the interaction with the anti-war movement. Um, the moderator for the program is Heather Booth. Uh, if you look on the page, where we have the registration link, you'll see long bios of everybody, or at least bios of everybody and, and some other resources. And Heather uh, is an old friend. Um, I'm going to try to, to pull something else up uh, as she talks, where you'll see her from uh, Mississippi in 1964 when we first met each other. Um, so the only mechanics I'll say is that the chat will be closed until we get to the discussion portion. And, but Q&A are open if you have questions to ask. Um, we're not going to be able to recognize people visually in this, given the number of folks that have registered. So, uh, and we're now up to 124 already. So I will now turn it over to Heather. Well, we welcome you all movement veterans and those who remember the movement or remember the stories of the movement and want to remember it and carry on its legacy. It's wonderful to be your movement partner and to be in a night where we are remembering the movement and the music that helped inspire us to end that war in Vietnam. 
and hearing Pete Seeger uh, bring them home. I hope many of you were perhaps on mute, but singing along. It immediately raised my spirits because it reminded us about a time when song spoke to the rising movement of people across generations coming together to stop not only an unjust war, but against a military industrial system and the powers behind it. It brings joy to remember the movement fighting for democracy, justice, equality, and peace, especially now at a time when all of those are under attack, democracy, freedom, justice, peace, equality. But we also see a rising movement, probably greater in number than we even had in the 60s, that is in support of freedom, justice, democracy, and peace. This picture, by the way, is of me at 18 years old in Rollville, Mississippi. That's Fannie Lou Hamer, the great heroine in front of her house in Rollville. It's where John McAuliffe and I first met. Now, the movement against the war in Vietnam did help change the political equation so that finally a majority of the country opposed the war and the senseless, senseless killing that seemed to have no end. And even for those who formally supported it, it seemed to have no rationale. This program was largely conceived of by John McAuliffe, who's continued to work for peace and addressing the problems created by what the Vietnamese call the American War. John and I were on the same Mississippi Freedom Summer Project in 1964 in Shaw, Mississippi, and then in Cleveland. And he's continued building movement for justice over the last 50 years and more. This program is designed to connect with and update former members of the anti-war movement who are moved by the music, as well as current activists and our counterparts. It also created and will create an archive to be posted on YouTube of the anti-war movement and will be in peace collections like that at Swarthmore College to be available for future activists, musicians, scholars, and we'll be sharing the conversation and music that will go on for about 90 minutes. Tonight, we have three remarkable performers, activists, organizers who are lifelong dedicated to this movement for justice and peace. Each will present a video or recording of an anti-war movement song that was meaningful to them. And then we'll discuss with each of them about that song and about the music that they played or that played in their lives and about building the movement for peace and justice and democracy. After a couple of rounds of those musical movement memories, we'll engage as a group, connecting not only to what the music meant in those days, but what it provides for us today. And what are the sources of inspiration for today's movements in whatever form it takes? In the last 10 or 15 minutes of the program, John McAuliffe will take us some questions that you may have in the, um, in the Q&A. The three panelists we have are really treasures. Reggie Harris is an innovative guitarist, fearlessly creative vocalist, and an engaging storyteller whose concert performances are infused with joy. It's clear to all that he deeply loves singing and that it's more than his work, but that's not all. He's uniquely committed to music as a community building vehicle. Reggie's music shares insightful perspectives on issues of life, history, education, and human rights. It's in the spirit of his mentors, Pete Seeger and Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, founder of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Reggie's a master song leader who loves to help people discover that they can make a difference at any age, wherever they may live. And we'll hear then Sonny Oaks a radio host, concert producer, major festival volunteer in many capacities, and a volunteer at folk conferences. She's the creator of Wisdom of the Elders, a much loved event which began in 2010 at the Northeast Regional Folk Alliance and is now a monthly podcast on any RFA webpage. She's also Phil Oaks's sister. You can see his picture in her background and has produced the Phil Oaks Song Nights for 39 years internationally. She's the host of Folk Music and Other Stuff, a monthly radio show on Folk Music Notebook. Sonny was, Sonny was presented with a Spirit of Folk Award at the Folk Alliance International in 2019. 
And then there's Peter Yarrow, our favorite dragon, movement musician, godfather, long distance runner of so many movements, a love-filled organizing performer and activist, beloved by generations because of his music and movement building involvement, building a more just and peaceful world. Beginning in the 1960s, the music of Peter, Paul and Mary became for literally millions of people, the genesis of our activism and lifelong commitment to advancing positive social change. Peter's gift for songwriting has produced some of the most moving songs that in the Peter, Paul and Mary repertoire, including Puff the Magic Dragon, Day is Done, Light One Candle, and The Great Mandela and others. And it's so important to have these now when we are on a knife's edge between democracy and tyranny. The music can help raise our spirits for the struggles of today. And now we open with a classic from Phil Oaks, I Ain't Marching Anymore, and turn to Sunny about her brother, the song and the movement it reflected that inspired us so. Hello out there. Thank you for joining our show. I'm Sunny Oaks, and as, as Heather said, the sister of Phil Oaks. <laughs> I've been living under that mantle for many, many years. And um, Phil was one of the main forces in the anti-war movement when it came to, to music. He wrote many songs about Vietnam against the participation of, in the war. And his most famous one was I Ain't Marching Anymore. He sang it on campuses all across the country. He sang it at all of the major New York and in Washington, DC. And he, I was so proud of him. The point I wanted to make, he sang it in so many places, but to me, the, the ultimate, the, the, the most amazing was at the Chicago convention. He sang in a huge auditorium. He sang, I ain't marching anymore. You could see in the audience, one after another draft cards being burned while he sang, I ain't marching anymore. The, the audience just took on the spirit and went with it. And it was one of the, probably one of the proudest moments of Phil's life that he had made this happen. And one thing I would like to say is we've done 39 years of Phil Oaks Song Nights and the words are in the, in the chorus, it's always the old who lead us to the war, always the young to fall. But one of the people in the song I came up with, it's always the rich who lead us to the war, always the poor who fall. So, I mean, there's that thought and it's so relevant, especially today with the rich trying to take over everything. Battle of New Orleans at the end of the early British wars. The young land started growing, the young blood started flowing, but I ain't a marching anymore. For I killed my share of engines in a thousand different fights. I was there at the little big horn. I heard many men lying, I saw many more a dying, but I ain't a marching anymore. It's always the old to lead us to the wars, always the young to fall. Now look at all we want with a saber and a gun. Tell me, is it worth it all? For I stole California from the Mexican land, fought in the bloody Civil War. Yes, I even killed my brothers and so many others, but I ain't a marching anymore. For I marched to the battles of the German trench In a war that was bound to end all wars Oh, I must have killed a million men And now they want me back again But I ain't a marching anymore It's always the old to lead us to the wars Always the young to fall Now look at all we've won with a saber and the gun Tell me, is it worth it all? For I flew the 
final mission in the Japanese sky Set off the mighty mushroom roar When I saw the cities burning I knew that I was learning That I ain't marching anymore Now the labor leaders screaming When they close the missile plant United Fruit screams at the Cuban shore Call it peace or call it treason Call it love or call it reason But I ain't marching anymore Oh, Sonny, it just brings back so many memories and raises our spirits. Tell us a little more, Sonny, about uh, Phil's involvement in the movement. Remind us about it. I remember that uh, his singing at the at the 68 convention uh, and also how you keep his legacy alive. OK, well, one thing I want to mention is that that song, Phil put out a songbook his first songbook in 1964. I think that's like way back. And in 1964, that song was already in the songbook. He had written it quite early in the war. Wow. Um, it's amazing. I, I was surprised to see that the other day. And he, he, he would go around, as I said, college campuses. At one point, I think it was Jerry Rubin invited him to come out and speak at Berkeley at a rally, a uh, student rally in Berkeley. And Bill had a paid engagement, which he, he he undid. He didn't take the money. He instead he went out to Berkeley to sing for the students for free because he felt so strongly about the, the war. And as I said, this was his signature song, and it's just been amazing how, how many people are still singing it. Every time we do a song night, this song is definitely included. As I said, thirty nine years of keeping his music alive. Thanks so much, Sonny. Thanks so much. And uh, Reggie had said he was so deeply impacted by Phil's words and music. And I wanted Reggie to tell us some about his own uh, movement involvement and how he connected with Phil. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just say that I'm thrilled and, and honored to be here. Um, and Sonny has been uh, my great connector in so many ways. I met Sonny at the, uh, an event in Philadelphia and uh, she invited uh, my partner Kim and I to come and sing for a Phil Oaks song night. And, uh, and she said, so what song would you like to do? And I said, well, we don't know any. <laughs> um, I was born in 1952. I was in school. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1970. Uh, Phil didn't come across my uh, radar until probably um, just before he died when I heard changes on the radio. Uh, but Sonny was gracious and she sent five songs uh, and I listened to this man who obviously was so passionate, obviously was so skilled and obviously was so honest. Um, I was a, a young beginning songwriter and uh, going to that Phil Oak song night, the first one at the bottom line in New York City and seeing all of these amazing performers coming out uh, to play these songs. I couldn't believe the, the breadth of song that he had, and so many of them connecting to uh, the anti-war theme and passionately informing the public about what our government was up to. So true. And uh, Peter, now I, I do want to know from you, since your singing uh, helped to create, reflect, and promote the spirit of our movement for so many years, if you could tell us a little bit about your connection to Phil. Um, and, uh, and also respond to what uh, Sonny and Reggie have just said. I, I'll lead off by saying that there are only a few people that I know who threw themselves into the effort to make the world a better place or to save us from the catastrophic realities that were happening around us, who took the burden of that, of those challenges of those horrific times on their shoulders and every person who suffered because of it became there incorporated into their 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 corpuscles so you Mather, i know you have that character too you're you're stalwart but i know that 
your heart breaks on a daily. I mean, it's a, it's a bounce. That's what Phil was. I mean, the, uh, you know, I think Reggie, you're right about the breadth. One of the most beautiful, sweetest love songs is, you know, um, is is uh, what what's the name of that song you mentioned? Is that okay, mm -hmm. sit by my side. Come as close as the air. I mean, just, and um, he was at Newport, and he was the only one of the great songwriters of the time that was steadfast in this way. He was, I mean, we all were out there with our whole hearts, but Phil was the rock of Gibraltar. And you know, there were people who are very gifted, incredible songwriters, who some of them abandoned said, I want to sing my own passions, I want to sing personal songs. Phil was married to the movement. And when he sang, his heart was filled with beauty and joy, but also the suffering of all the people that he was singing about. Peter, those very moving and really captures it, captures his spirit. I, I, I wonder, Reggie, because you are such a gifted songwriter yourself, I think we'd like to know a little bit more about you and share with us a song you've chosen that spreads the movement and continues to do so even today. Well. You know, I, uh, I, as I mentioned in, in the early days, I was a, a beginning songwriter. And so I was looking around for role models, people whose uh, gift of taking uh, a message and crafting it, you know, not only a song, a lot of people write songs that are, you know, um, just kind of stating the, stating the point. Uh, Phil was an uh, astonishing craftsman, um, a, a musician who understood the relationship of melody and message. Um, so it was a really great role model to, to study. And as I said, that first night, I heard all of these songs, you know, it's all so very different, so di very diverse. Um, and yet, as I heard songs like Cops of the World, you know, which, you know, really in your face song identifying what our government was doing around the world in terms of bombing and overcoming governments. Uh, as I heard songs like One More Parade, uh, so strong, so uh, fast, so ready for the war, so willing to die in, you know, on a foreign shore. Now, Phil as Peter said, engage those forces, but he engaged them with a creativity that as a young musician, um, I, I really was drawn to. And the one night that we were uh, doing a song night, um, I heard someone perform a song that um, Phil wrote when he was actually in Hawaii. Uh, he was there, I think actually just kind of uh, on an R&R &R himself, uh, visiting, probably singing some, but he ran into a soldier who was on R and R from Vietnam, and the story goes that he he and the soldier launched into a conversation. You know, Phil got his information, and this was the other thing. Uh, James Baldwin once said in a, a lecture that I was part of, he said, "The artist is responsible for looking around and observing what's happening, and then reporting that, taking that into your filter, and showing the world what you see." And Phil was unafraid to show the world really difficult things. So this soldier talking about his experience inspired a song. Uh, I'll do part of this song uh, because of time. Phil didn't particularly write short songs, <laughs> but the power of the song, I'll tag the, the beginning of the song and then also a couple of verses from the end. There's a man walking around the island with a snake cane. Picked it up in Thailand from a hurricane. And you know he's not gonna go there. He's been one time too long. Now all the gods are gone. The younger boys are drowning in a shallow sea. 
night belongs to snipers in a palm trees. And their sabers flash like lightning in the cars of a last brigade. They must have been afraid. Soldiers have their sorrow, the wretched have their rage. Pray for the aged, it's the dawn of another age, of another age, of another age, of another age. He goes on in that song to talk about the fact that we're all the victims of, uh, of propaganda and, and of learning, being punished for things when we stand out. And uh, he, as he, he brings the song in and goes back into history and points up, Thomas Paine and Jesse James were old friends. Robin Hood is riding on the road again. We were born in a revolution and we died in a wasted war. It's gone that way before. Well, the dogs are chasing chicken bones across the lawn. Well, if that was an election, I'm the Viet Cong. So I pledge allegiance against the flag and the fall for which it stands. I'll raise it if I can. So he had the amazing uh, acuity to give you a history lesson in the song, tying all of those images together, and at the same time, create a singable melody <laughs> and a really powerful vehicle for the message, which was, of course, anti-war. Boy, when you say a history lesson in the song, some of the lines you said, I feel, are as current as today victims of propaganda yeah. i mean what are we what are we facing today or born in a revolution and we but died, died in a wasted, wasted war. war it just um and now but we are going to live we are the music lives on we live on reggie just fabulous i i also want to ask sunny then to react to reggie because sunny and reggie have been friends throughout the years and then we'll turn over to peter but sunny uh What's your reaction to what uh, Reggie just sang and told us about? Reggie and I have been friends for about 40 years now. We've traveled all around the country together. We've traveled to Canada. We've shared rooms. We've shared wonderful experiences. And it's been such a pleasure to watch Reggie as he learns more and more of Phil's songs and and just does so much with them. My favorite is that he, they took the song, What's That I Hear, which is a very straight, it was, as a matter of fact, it was a show on TV, Laura Weber, where she taught guitar. That was her opening song was What's That I Hear. And Reggie and, and Kim took that song. And I don't know who worked with them. Was it, it might've been Tom Posado Rao, I'm not sure. It was Tom Posado Rao and uh, Greg Greenway and Pat Wichter. Right, and they sat down and they took that song and turned it into a Motown song. <laughs> I mean, wow. This absolutely incredible version of that song. I, I, I know this sounds crazy, but that's one of the things I really wish that Phil had lived to hear because I think Phil would have been so tickled to hear his song come out as a Motown song. <laughs> <laughs> and it's thanks to Reggie that that, that happened. But his inter Peter, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I want to say that Mary Travers used to say, and this is a folk music, she said, if you're going to sing me, you have to live me. And it, it, it was powerful. And that's what, what we get from Phil, as powerful as his acumen and his poetry is, what you feel is that he is that he is you and you are he, for instance, in there but for fortune. He literally is saying and feeling what you are experiencing now, what the people in Ukraine are experiencing. There, I'm experiencing it too, and you felt it. So what his what his capacity was was to have a brilliant take on things, but also 
emotionally people felt, oh, validated. Oh, I understand this feeling. It's not about the war. It's about the basic feeling we have for one another. And that's what you got from him as well as all the other things. And you know, even in, even in the Q&A that's been put in now, I see Stephen Spitz, who's a, a longtime movement partner, uh, writes in it that he drove Phil from that concert that you mentioned uh, in 68 uh, to his hotel. And I think each of us, we want that relationship with him. We, or we even felt we had that relationship with him because his music was both historic and personal. And now with that, I do want to turn to our, uh, our good trouble, good organizer, good music maker, Peter Yarrow. We have a video of two different performances. Uh, the first from the 1963 uh, March on Washington. And the first person you'll see, by the way, is Ozzie Davis, who many of you do know, but Ozzie Davis was a civil rights champion and extraordinary performer, actor, and it's introducing Blowing in the Wind. And then there's a second video with Peter, Paul, and Mary, and then with others, with John Denver, a singing gift a chant. A group of singers who have come to help express and song what this great meeting is all about. I give you now Peter, Paul, and Mary. I started to sing, and I had an epiphany looking out at this quarter of a million people. And I truly believed at that moment it was possible that human beings could join together to make a positive social change.
Peter, it is so moving to see it, to see you, and also to see some of our fallen heroes of Mary, of Ossie Davis, of John Denver. And we're glad you're here with us now. We welcome your comments about the experience of those songs and also about the interconnection of the movements of civil rights against war, against unjust wars, for peace, for democracy. Absolutely, Heather. When we sang, I mean, to me, it's just, it was, I was sitting there editing this together for this program. It, it, I, so I had an epiphany myself. I, I realized I saw that the hopefulness and the, the, the heartfelt sweetness of Peter, Paul, and Marion blowing in the wind in 63. And goodness knows there was danger in the civil rights movement and there were there was bloodshed and there were people, goodness knows, but the heartache by the time we segued into uh, the anti-war movement and of course Martin Luther King said there is no justice without peace and there is no peace without justice they are one and the same thing and we know that now he what what happened was after these eight years had passed between these two videos you see a maturation of sorrow and pain and determination and you can see that where we had learned that in these marches, we, if we call out, if we channel the idea that we are directly speaking, sing it for Nixon, sing it to him, bring them home, that somehow it got through. And the most amazing thing that happened was that these marches, such as the ones that you saw, actually had an incredibly powerful effect. They frightened. Uh, you can read in McNamara's book, you know how they shook when they hear this music because the, the music, as much as it moved us, let them know our power. It's, it's like a, with the uh, Maori, when they do their dance you know, before they play ball, you know, it's an art form, but it's not entertainment, Peter, Paul, and Mary never entertained. That's why Ozzie Davis said, and now to share with us in word and song and musically how this, what we're all about. And Sonny, I think that that was the case with, with Phil so much that he knew that uh, he was not entertaining. And Sonny, why don't you go off mute and let us know how you think Phil saw the relationship between the various movements and his role as the as the singer connecting the movements connecting us before i answer that i have to say peter i was at that march on washington in 1963 i saw you in person singing and peter paul and mary were one of the two reasons that i ever started to listen to folk music the other was the kingston trio and I just can't thank you so much for what you have done for me in terms of my musical growth and my musical knowledge. You guys were just the top. There was nobody as good as you. And thank you for all, all the work you did in that. And, and the, the songs that you chose, you know, you didn't mention my favorite one of yours. My favorite song of yours was uh, Weave Me the Sunshine. That is the most uplifting song I think I have ever heard. I just played it on my radio show recently. I absolutely love that song. And um, well, all of the music was interconnected, obviously, because we were choosing songs that were putting down the, the war, trying to end the war. And of course, there's that channel where the, everything comes together. But you were just great. And your version of uh, you guys sang There But For Fortune, and I have to ask you, I'm asking you publicly, there was a fourth verse in there, show me the famine, show me the frail, show me the, was it? Children whose eyes are growing pale. And I'll show you the uh, the children with many reasons why. Who wrote that verse? 
We did. We did in concert. That's, as, as, as a group, you wrote it? Absolutely. And we don't ever take it's Phil's song. We ask permission oh, no. to add it. The sense of love between and respect between the, the people who were, were involved in this music as it became. I, I, I think it was people that said to me, you provided that you were the conscience because you you validated our feelings and you alerted us to questions we had to have answered. You know, I mean, that this song was so, and we, we extended it to that. And Sonny, I want to tell you, uh, I sang it with the concert with Matthew Shepard at the trial, the second trial. Everybody was together and I wrote a verse for it about LGBTQ. It's a, it's a song that 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 is it's at the base of all the other political kinds of statements about caring about each other. Well, well there you go, Heather. There's a perfect example of how the musicians yes joined together and, and just built something even better as a unit. Well, I think I wanted to just uh, throw in that you know there is not there's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence that all of those performers, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, Pete Seeger, uh, Phil Oaks, they, also, they committed themselves to the civil rights movement in a way that many other performers and actors didn't. And, you know, they went to the South, they went to uh, join in, they, they grabbed the passion of the songs there and added into that mix. So they brought a lot of that uh, spirit and emotion and also purpose that they discovered in the movement into the anti-war movement, which also, they had also built relationships. All of those people had built relationships with folks. One of the things that I immediately, as you know, Sonny began to introduce me and as I became part of the Phil Oaks family, is that I recognized that all of those folks at a time when it wasn't popular were not afraid to sing about black folks. They were not afraid to sing about the intersectionality of all of these struggles. And as one who came from Philadelphia, who came out of a community that was deeply ravaged, Edison High School in Philadelphia was the uh, single, uh, they contributed the single most uh, victims in the Civil War, in the uh, Vietnam War, of any high school in America. Wow. And it was a school that was not far from me. And there were two other high schools in Philadelphia that were not far behind. I think Edison High School, there's a documentary that, that chronicles that 64 of their students died in the Vietnam War. Uh, two other Philadelphia schools contributed up about 27 each. So the, these songs as they were rising and as we saw these people, you know, Peter, Paul and Mary on TV singing, If I Had a Hammer, well, tying that to Pete Seeger. And, and as Phil sang all the songs about Mississippi, the struggles that were there, you know, the fact that black folks were going over and fighting in the war and that our, our communities were being ravaged was a direct tie intersectionally to this struggle that was uh, across America. You know, we should remember, Reggie, I'm so glad you raised it in this way, that race runs through all of our politics and all of America. Yeah. The freedom singers who came out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, not only were there as part of the struggle, they were staffers for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were organizers right. who also were the singers. And when SNCC, when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came out against the war in Vietnam with Julian Bond as the communications director for SNCC. Um, it was explosive within the movement and within the country because we were explicitly saying the movements are together, right. led by African-American singer organizers. Um, and we should also remember Joan Baez came to Mississippi, uh, as did uh, Bob Dylan. And, yes. uh, and others who were, in effect, willing to put their body on the line. Theodore Bikel as well. Bill went down to Mississippi, Freedom Summer in 1964. And here's a cute little story. He sang at a church in a, a small town in Mississippi. The, the following 
day, I believe the church was bombed. And Phil wanted to know, was it, was it a, a reflection <laughs> on his singing? <laughs> and then he's got the great song, Mississippi, find, find yourself another country, the, the country you've torn out the heart of. Mississippi, he wrote, find yourself another country to be part of. He wrote five songs with Mississippi in the title. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I, you know, I, I was uh, standing in uh, the church uh, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and standing at that uh, gravestone that they have for Goodwin, Schroner, and Cheney, who were, of course, investigating the burning of the church and the beating of the people there. And as I was standing there, I was thinking about those songs uh, that Phil wrote in Mississippi. And I was also thinking about the fact that on the night that they found the bodies of Goodwin, Schroner, and Cheney, I believe that Pete Seeger was doing a concert in Meridian, Mississippi, and he was asked by the leaders there to make the announcement to the crowd that the bodies had been found. You know, there's a story I sometimes tell. When, when I was in Mississippi with John and, and other Northern students who were recruited to be brought down, people often said to each other, are you willing to die for freedom? And though I very much wanted to live, I was willing to take the risk to support courageous African-Americans struggling for a decent life. But what I realize now is that the most important question we should ask is, are you willing to live for freedom? Are you willing to do the work every day when it's too hot or too cold or too boring or I'm too tired? Are we willing to live for freedom? And it is in part the songs of our movement, the songs of our lives that give us the hope to carry on. But with that, Peter, we turn to you for another song. Heather, the, the song that I've chosen to sing is so hyper-personal that, uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to sing it uh, in, in concert because I, 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 I bring back the, the, the sense of the trauma, you know, uh, see, let me go back a step back. In the civil rights movement, which, by the way, was the genesis of the anti-war movement, that it, it wasn't linked. It was. It was the same people, only it got bigger and involved more people, and then it was both. And then that fed the women's movement, and then, you know, it, it, it went on from there. But when Peter, Paul, and Mary went to Frankfurt, Kentucky, to sing at a, a march uh, with um, Martin Luther King there, and then did a concert, there was, uh, Mary was pregnant, and she got a letter saying, if you go there, we're going to kill you. Now, wow. absolutely. And she was pregnant. You know, she had a responsibility. We were part of this determination you're talking about, about living in, uh, be became something that we could inspire in each other. And part of it took from Phil and part of it most of it came from Pete, because Pete was the most resolute and the leaders. Well, anyhow, we went there and a bomb went off, but it was a stink bomb. It was just the cowardly stuff that is done that presaged what's what were some of the acts that go on now. But for us, it was minor danger. If you look at the civil rights movement, you see with the people and the beatings and the deaths, and the, and you go to the Rosa Parks Museum, you see all the names on the wall. And so when I sing the great Mandela, I I see my own history of singing this. Uh, I see it. And Mandela, I, I see the Vietnam veterans against the war in that film where they came back and told of the atrocities that they had seen and they had committed. The Winter Soldier, it's called. And the agony, you know, the more, I'm, I'm, 
I've been told, and I think it's accurate, that more Vietnam veterans have committed suicide than were killed in battle. The trauma of this, when I sing it, and then in the chorus, you know, I'm telling a story about a, a war resistor, a war, the person that refuses to go to war. But in the chorus, it says, we have to, to make our choice in life, take a place on the Buddhist prayer will of the Mandela. Win or lose, you have to choose. And if you lose, you've only wasted your life in terms of that perspective. <laughs>
take your place on the great bend as it moves through your brief moment of time when I lose now you must choose now and if you lose you're only losing your life and if you lose you're only losing your life and if you lose you're only wasted your life. I feel we needed to take a minute after that, the power of that song. Peter, I hadn't realize this before but it feels almost like a Bertolt Brecht song and particularly how you sang it now and probably as timeless thank you for that thank you you know I think I was mentioning before after all the concerts Peter Paul and Mary were doing during the Vietnam War afterwards we would stay. And I was the real, you know, self-punishment guy. I'd stay until two in the morning. We were talking, and what were we talking about? We were talking about these young college kids that were frightened, that were angry, that were feeling trapped. And then they said, what do I do, Peter? Do I go to jail? Do I go to Canada? What should I do? Do I, you know, uh, go get... Uh, to the draft board. Well, I was doing after after the war. I was doing an appearance somewhere in the Midwest, and the, the person on the microphone said, um, oh, "Not the interviewing me. Sorry, not on the microphone. I'm on the microphone." <laughs> the person interviewing me said, "After we do the interview, I'd like to talk to you privately." And I saw it was serious. She took me to the control room. She said, I have to tell you this. My boyfriend, when his draft notice came around, is listening to your song. And he said, I am not going to go to the war. And he examined the alternatives. He said, I am going to tell the judge I'm not going to do it. And he went to the judge, and the judge said, look, you have no history of conscientious objector in your religion or your background. I'm sorry. But in the absence of something that you can tell me to persuade me, I am going to have to pronounce send you a, a sentence and send you to jail. And he said, Your Honor, may I sing you a song? And the judge said, well, this is a very important moment. I guess so. And he sang the great Mandela. He finished it and the judge raised his head and he said, you don't have to go to jail. And that's to me symbolic of the, the most precious kind of knowledge that sometimes these songs, like Phil's songs, these were not songs to engage. They built community and they asked yes, we slid a lot up. But people got in touch with their hearts, their hearts that were needed to meld together. And I'm so proud to have been a part of that. And Reggie, to been, be in the streets still with you. And, and Sonny, I look upon you, you know, this almost famous film, which is so passionate and, and people all are, because the people who surrounded us, the Albert Grossmans and the road managers and, the, and our sound people, the people who produced the concerts like yourself, did the radio, these 
this was my these were, this is my family. And Peter, I want to build on that in the few minutes we have before we open it up for questions. We have about five minutes. I wanted to bring it actually up to date on exactly the theme you're describing, that you would stay after and talk to people, the young people, the people of that day. And now I want to ask about what is the meaning for the people of today? And I saw there was a couple of questions, one from uh, the wonderful movement champion, Letty Cotton Pogrebin, I see in the Q&A, but also some others who are uh, asking what what is the meaning of the music today and the movements today and the relationship of them? And just to kick it off, it seems to me that in this time, the movements have so expanded that there are movements all around us, probably with more people active than even were active in the 60s. But we had movements in sequence, almost a civil rights movement, a anti-war movement, a women's movement, a environmental movement. And now all of it starts to come together, a fight for 15, Black Lives Matter, a women's march, political efforts. We're now living in a period of such turmoil. And the music is all around us. Now you can you put on your earbuds and you hear your own uh, collection. Um, and uh, I asked my kids, who were in their 50s, uh, what are some of the songs of today for our movements? Some that they proposed, some that they just mentioned off the top of their heads. Childish Gambino, This Is America. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think, John, when you put up the links to these different songs, following this, I do think it's worth putting up some of the current songs, but Childish Gambino, This Is America, the video is unbelievable for those who haven't seen it, or uh, remarkable. Uh, Kendrick Lamar, All Right. Lil Baby, We the People, A Tribe Called Quest. The Playing for Change music that many of us have heard. J.C. Byer, Good Trouble, again in a, the tradition, and then Sweet Honey in the Rock, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. So I wanted to ask all of you, what music do you think now inspires you? And what are the comments you have about the movements of today and the music that reflects those movements? Uh, Reggie. Well, I've had uh, the great privilege uh, since uh, things have opened up to hit a number of college campuses. Um, I recently have been on the College of St. Joseph uh, University in Philadelphia and Nazareth College in Rochester and down to Tougaloo College in, in Mississippi and I uh, just spent uh, two days at Wooster College in, in Ohio and uh, talking to the students um, and them talking back about that, that very thing, asking them what music is engaging them. For myself, in looking to make contact with them, I'm, uh, I'm shifting my music and again, songs that were, have been inspired by some of these people that we've been talking about. I come out of this, this history. I released an album uh, in tw 2021 uh, called On Solid Ground. We will not rest till the storm is over. We will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. On that album, I also had a song called It's Who We Are. And, uh, and that song became number one in the folk DJ charts uh, for the month of May in 2021. I engage the students in conversation because I, I love the fact that Peter mentioned the, in, the entertainment uh, because so much of our culture has pushed uh, our public into entertainment frameworks uh, to sell the music and to, to get people, really to get them distracted. But people that you mentioned, you know, Chido Scambino and, and look, Kendrick Lamar and, and so many of the others, they're cutting through all of that. Uh, 
So as I sing these songs, and I, I do sing these songs that I'm singing, I'm still singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. The students don't know these songs, but they come alive when they hear them. And, and then that gives me the opportunity to engage them, to remind them, or maybe for the first time, to tell them. Uh, and some of them I get to take on pilgrimage to those places. Uh, so they see the intersectionality of what they're struggling with. I think we have to make those connections for the younger group, but also what I said to a group last week at the College of Worcester. Many of us are learning that we have something to add, but we also have baggage that you don't necessarily need to own. So in that way, I'm willing to get out of the way and look for choice opportunities to add in what I can and learn new things from them. How, how wonderful. I also, I particularly, uh, while you were talking, I just checked out what the questions are. By the way, there's love and affection going for um, all of you <laughs> singer, activist, organizers. But one of the comments comes from Holly Near, who is listening in. And if there is a great singer, activist, organizer, lifelong values-driven, songwriter, <laughs> inspiring person, Holly Near is one of them. And she recognizes Chris Matthews. And I've traveled to hear Chris Matthews sing. And we've both been on organizing programs together. So yes, the, the, uh, Chris is certainly one of the most uh, remarkable of the current generation. Uh, Revolution is another. I, I was just going to give just a couple of names. And to me, Chris Matthews is like the up and coming young woman who no holds bar. She tells it like it is. She doesn't mess around. And she's one to watch because she's going to be one of the leaders of, of the movement now. And I love humor. And if you like to laugh, and we need to laugh. Roy Zimmerman, my God, <laughs> he, he just skewers everything with, with comedy. He's just amazing. He has a, a CD called The Faucets on Fire, which of course is dealing with fracking. I mean, he, he's just terrific. Tom Prasad Rao wrote a song for George Floyd called $20 Bill. I mean, it's just one of the most powerful songs I've ever heard. And there's another, another young group coming up now, Windborn. They are very political. And so if you're looking for political people, Joe Jenks with the labor songs, Emma's Revolution. I mean, they're-, they're Emma's they're, Revolution appeared just now in the chat. Thanks, Sonny. Oh, they're, they're out there. I mean, th those people are there. And if you listen to my radio show, you'll hear them all the time. <laughs> that's, that's and when, we, when the, the tape is made of it, we'll put on the link to your radio show. I wondered, uh, we're now supposed to turn to uh, the general Q and A. Um, of Peter? course, yeah. I'm going to mention a framework to understand this about the next generation. What we are blessed with at this time is the emergence of power in the marginalized and oppressed populations that did not have a voice in our country before. We're talking about LGBTQ. We're talking about kids in school that wonder whether they're going to be killed. We're talking about Black Lives, Black people, Black Lives Matter that organize a nationwide. We're talking about the, the people have, have, who have been marginalized. So then they all have their music and they all have. So let me refer to that. Uh, I went down, I was asked to write a song for the Parkland students, but I said, they've got to write it themselves. And I took down 12 songwriters and we mentored them. And Steve Seskin did that. I am telling you, those songs, you know what this first song was, what they decided, 35 of them to do it? You won't believe these songs, by the way. They said, this is a song for the silenced. These are kids who had seen their friends shot or in despair or and we were they would we'd be working on their face it was it was so therapeutic so inspiring and for me i wrote that it was 
when I was reflecting on it, that it was uh, comparable to the kind of incredible feeling of connection with that I got from being on the march in Washington in 63. Number two, there is a group called the Peace Poets. Two of them came down there. And when I heard them, I understood what rap was about. They are unbelievable. And they are all seminarians from South America living here. And the third thing I want to mention that I think is so important is that there is an entity that's run by Noel Paul Stuckey's daughter, Liz Stuckey. It's unbelievable. They, you know what their new project is? They've just gotten very significant funding to take activist singers who have that predisposition and teach them the ropes by sending them to the Midwest Academy. I'm kidding, but they should go to the Midwest Academy. <laughs> <laughs> the training center I have started for organizers. Peter, right. you are an organizer, a singer, a performer, and you touch our hearts. I do think at this point we should open it up though. Uh, John, with about 10 minutes left for our program, uh, are there questions that people have raised? I saw one that I thought was interesting uh, for Sonny. But John, did you have- No, go ahead. I'll raise the it's mostly comments. It's not, oh. there are very few questions. And oh, one... I, I, saw, I saw a few. One right. was that I, that I had myself for Sonny, which was, you must have been in a remarkable family, Sonny, that you are in this, uh, you are in the movement. Phil was in the movement. He had this um, connection to so many movements. Uh, and there was someone who asked about what your family background was. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. We were totally non-political. The only political thing. Really. I the only political thing I remember is when I was in high school in the fifties, walking through the living room, and my parents were watching this show on TV, and it was the McCarthy hearings. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, we never discussed politics in our family. Bill became politicized because of his roommate at college, Jim Glover. Uh, Jim's father was a socialist and an activist. And actually, it was Jim's father who indoctrinated Phil. And of course, me listening to Phil doing the music, I, I got ind indoctrinated th through them as well. and. Uh, all of our politics came later because it was certainly not from the home. And uh, uh, Reggie, do you want to say how you came into this also? Well, I actually, I can blame Sonny for some of this, um, but there was a woman in uh, Philadelphia um, back in the early, uh, late 80s and early 1990s, uh, Joyce Brown who started a group uh, called, um, uh, the, she started a club called the Blushing Zebra. And it was a place to play. And I got to meet Earl Robinson. I got to meet Pete Seeger there. Mm -hmm. And then I got invited to the People's Music Network uh, for Songs of Freedom and Struggle. And, um, and I suddenly, uh, it, the whole uh, panoply of, of social action opened up taking me back to all that was surrounding me in Philadelphia with people like uh, Reverend Leon Sullivan leading boycotts and, um, and, and just some of the folks that were happening there. So yeah, it was mostly through uh, the love of uh, activity around connecting people to their hearts and then seeing how that music, and then of course, you know, these songs were being sung as I was raised up in the, my church growing up. Uh, even though my family also was not particularly political. And Peter, we know you've actually passed on the lessons through Bethany and your own children. Oh, she's unbelievable. We were at Standing Rock together and she was singing uh, there. She, we could she, well, she got arrested and there she is walking out with her arms in handcuffs at a demonstration about the pipe, uh, pipelines. She said, we shall not, we shall intrepid. She is a force of nature and she is uh, very, very deeply involved with uh, building a, uh, a, 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 a repatriation, a, a bringing back of the Native American to the 
Schoharie Valley who were there initially. But, and, and she's amazing. And she was also affected by, there were three people that really politicized me. First, my mother, who's a member of, she was a teacher. And she's very scared because of the McCarthy arrest. She said, don't open the door unless you hear the, this is the sound. And then my, uh, uh, she was, you know, uh, it was all about her ethics. She was a teacher. She had immigrated from, from, from Russia at a very early age. And uh, it, it was embedded in her DNA. Then the second person that really did it the two, were two women both of whom I met in high school. One of them was Dorothy Miller, who became a coordinator at SNCC, married Dorothy Miller Zellner. The, and the last part. one was my high school sweetheart, Mimi Sigal, and she taught me songs like Le Deserteur. And she was amazing. And as much as I have a debt to Paul and Mary as partners in it, that legacy came from these people. You know, one nice thing that's happened since the move, the anti-war movement is I think many of us have become more sensitive to the role of women, to the role of the need for how race runs through everything and how from the beginning we need to have our movements reflect what America is. I wonder, just for a last comment for each person, we'll end with a comment from John uh, uh, telling us the next, the next um, stage of this program, of the uh, taping of the programs. Um, but if each of you have a comment for the current generation or um, a final uh, short 30 seconds of thought uh, to leave us with as we end this program, while people's comments are coming through uh, saying how much they love this program, love all of you, loved your singing, loved Phil, Peter, Reggie, Sonny. So for each of you, uh, Sonny, do you want to start a last minute uh, comment? Okay, all I can say is my mantra is if somebody asks you to do something, say yes, because the worst that'll happen is you'll have a boring time, but you might be exposed to wonderful new experiences and learn a whole lot about stuff that's out there that you didn't know about before. Get involved and please vote tomorrow. Reggie? I would say that uh, one of the most important things um, that I have realized over the course of years is that it's all about relationship. And we often think that, you know, the things that we say are going to, you know, change or, or the facts that we have. But the most important thing is to remember to keep continue to open yourself to developing relationship and keeping music at the center is a great way to start. Peter. This is first of all, John McAuliffe. Uh, you are one of my heroes. I went to Vietnam three times with you. Uh, the issue that was bringing us there at the time was Agent Orange and, and how we decimated the population with it. And the United States refused to take liability and responsibility. There was a lawsuit. And I, what you have done in terms of putting this together is just another uh, mark in your life. But to me, it's beautiful. And Heather, you know, you have no idea how much respect and love I have for you as a, a friend and an ally. And I, what, I, what I, I want to say is that most importantly, if you're watching this program, look at the relationship between us. Is this something that you want to have in your life? Is this kind of... We have all walks of we have organizer, organizer, you know, broadcaster, singer, songwriter. The the the, the respect and the, the fun that we have. I mean, if we were all together physically in the same room, we'd be 
having an amazing party. And we'd keep going all night. This is not a sacrifice. This is real. The, most of the other stuff is superficial. It's pre-programmed. It's canned. So many things in this world are not worth what this is. This is the real deal. So expose yourself to the honesty of people who, who sing from the heart, who come from the heart, and who live the music. Yeah, beautiful comments. Right. It's been a joy to be part of this. My thoughts always are that when we organize with the music to inspire us, when we organize, we have changed this world. We help to stop a war. We can drive forward freedom and democracy. When we organize, we will change this world with music to inspire us, the relationships as Reggie talked about them, to hold us together and with love at the center. Thank, Thank you. you all for being here tonight. I turn this back over to John, who's gonna tell us about the recordings where you can find it and what the next steps are uh, with an ongoing program. And may we build those movements for peace, for democracy, for freedom, and a more just world, and keep us singing. Thank you, Heather. Um, I have to clean up a little bit of a mistake, which is I was so flustered on the technical side that I didn't really tell you who Heather was. Um, she commented on our Mississippi history and on the Midwest Academy, which uh, institutionally probably did more to create activists and organizers than any other institution that came out of the 60s. 70s. So she deserves a special appreciation for that, as you saw in, in the way she handled this program. The other thing, if you look on her bio, and I hadn't realized this until we were talking a month or so ago, but you've seen the HBO show on the Janes and the film that's coming out about Jane, about the underground effort that was made to help women find places of safe abortions and Heather was a key organizer in that whole process. And hopefully it's not going to be a situation where the next generation of Heathers has to take up that, that role, but we will see what will happen in this country in the next few, the next day <laughs> to be pointed. Um, okay, two things on, or several things on procedure. One is, Somebody did question, so uh, why didn't you have a good tech person? We tried. Uh, if somebody knows a good tech person who would like to help us out on future programs, we would be more than happy to bring them into this picture. Um, the next show on December 5th in this series is with Holly Near, Linda Tillery, and Chris Matthews. There will be no tech problems on that because they basically did it as a produced program. And that's what you'll see. And then at the end of it, at least Holly will be there to, to answer questions and, and we'll see. And maybe Peter and Sonny and Reggie and Heather can come back into that conversation. Um, we do see this as a cumulative process. Uh, you'll see on the, the blog page where you registered, there's. If you didn't see it before, there's a list of 300 Vietnam songs and another list that a guy named Roger Peace has done that are actually links to videos. Um, we will, the videos we showed tonight will be, the links will be there. Um, and uh, I think that, that there'll be other programs. There's two other programs coming up. Uh, one would has to do with the issue of war crimes, which is brought about in the US war in Indochina, which is brought about as a discussion by Russian war crimes in Ukraine um, and how who should take responsibility for them. And then in December to 
lift up the anniversary of the Christmas bombing and the Paris peace agreement. We'll have a, a Zoom with two book authors uh, covering what was going on in Indochina and what was going on in, in the US politically. So you'll get notices about all of those things. I'm afraid that by signing up for this, you've signed up for uh, every month or so getting an update and uh, you can always take yourself off the list, but we hope that these will be useful to you. I should, should note that this program and the others are possible because of a grant from the AVK Foundation, uh, the AVK Arts Foundation. Um, and you can see its full name on, again, on the blog page. Um, so everything ultimately requires resources and we appreciate that help. Um, and we appreciate whatever donations people are moved to make from, from this program. Uh, we will naturally provide the link to do that when we do this follow-up message. The follow-up message, either tonight or tomorrow, I will have put this program on YouTube and we'll send out that link. So we encourage you to, to share that as widely as possible. Um, so I will actually leave one substantive question that I simply is to think about and some point I'd like to hear about it, but not to take more time now, which is the issue of how much physical presence was a factor. We know in the civil rights movement, it was an, the intimate involvement of people in the community with the music, with the singers, that both the community and the singers were at risk. And there was, an intimacy and identity that was inescapable. The anti-war movement was a little more distant. Um, a totally successful commercial group like Peter, Paul, and Mary also went to another level, as did Phil Oakes. Um, but, but still, there was a lot of physical interaction, as people have talked about. And it's simply a question in my mind in the world today in which the, like our audience here, we have now um, down to 99 people. We had 142 people. We never could have gotten this nationwide involvement in the past, um, but that is different. And I don't know what the back and forth relationship will be and how much the movement affects the singers and how the singers affect the movement. But we will leave that for our next discussion. Um, you have a bonus coming if you, there were a number of people who mentioned uh, draft dodger rag and the war is over and when I'm gone. We're going to play all those if you want to stay and watch them and we'll put the links to all of them on the blog page. So that's the end of my extended remarks and, and again, thank you everybody, Peter, Sonny, Reggie and Heather. Um, and uh, sorry again for the, the technical glitches, but I think the substance far overcame the technical glitches. So, or as my daughter taught me, this is what you do on Zoom. This is, I love you. This is my hug. So we'll see you on December 5th with Holly and the others. Any as with almost any protest these days, there is a folk song and a folk singer. This is the Gaslight Cafe in Greenwich Village. The folk singer is Phil Oakes. The song is The Draft Dodger Rag. Oh, I'm just a typical American boy from a typical American town. I believe in God and Senator Dodd and I keep an old Castro down. And when it came my time to serve, I knew better dead than rest. But when I got to my old draft board, buddy, this is what I said. Sarge, I'm only 18, I got a ruptured spleen, and I always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, my feet are flat, and my asthma's getting worse. Yes, think of my career, my sweetheart dear, my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool, I'm going to school, and I'm working in a defense plan. Ooh, 
H O N line. I hope he dies. But one thing you gotta see that someone's gotta go over there, and that someone isn't me. So I wish you well, Sarge. Give him hell. Kill me a thousand or so. And if you ever get a war without blood and gore, I'll be the first to go. Yes, I'm only 18, I got a ruptured spleen, and I always carry a purse. I've got eyes like a bat, and my feet are flat, and my asthma's getting worse. Yes, think of my career, my sweetheart dear, my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool, I'm a go to the school, and I'm working in a defense plan. Some of us have been uh, protesting against the war in Vietnam to a point where it became a sort of a mindless habit. And uh, we seem to be losing our effectiveness because the administration, those in power, always have longevity on their side. Uh, at a certain point, you keep saying, and decent, and decent, and, and the words lose their meaning. It's just the sound of syllables. It's not a word anymore. So uh, last uh, June, <clears throat> some of us in America declared the war over uh, from the bottom up. And, uh, and celebrated the end of the war. And we've been uh, celebrating ever since. And uh, the war, which of course was, which was never declared. And uh, it's the use of absurdity, it's the use of a, a form of street theater rather than just straight moral protest, the use of, the use of theatrical, change, changing reality in your heads. So here's a song called The War Is Over, which uh, I think can be applied to the Cold War. I think, I think uh, it's time that we, a lot of people in a lot of countries declared the Cold War over, which is sort of strangling the earth at the moment. People, you can recreate your own reality. This is what people forget when they become children of the media. Silent soldiers, honor silver screen framed in fantasies and drugged in dreams unpaid actors of the mystery the mad director knows that freedom will not make you free and what's this got to do with me I declare the war is over, it's over, it's over. Drums are drizzling on a grain of sand, fading rhythms of a fading land. Trust your leaders where mistakes are almost never made And they're afraid that I'm afraid I'm afraid the war is over It's over It's over Angry artist painting angry sign use their vision just to blind the blind boys and players of a grisly game one is guilty and the other gets to point the blame pardon me if I refrain I declare in her suicide find a flag so you can wave goodbye 
But just before the end, even treason might be worth a try. This country is too young to die. I declare the war is over. It's over. It's over. One-legged veterans will greet the dawn, and their whistling marches as they. Mow the lawn, and the gargoyles only sit and grieve. The gypsy fortune teller told me that we've been deceived. You only are what you believe. I'd like to do a song called When I'm Gone, which is about the philosophy of all the songs I write. There's no place in this world where I'll be long when I'm gone. And I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. And you won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone And the evenings and the mornings will be one when I'm gone Can't be singing louder than the guns while I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Every past generation All has had to disenthrall itself from an inheritance of truisms and stereotypes. For the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. So in our time, we must move on from the reassuring repetition of stale phrases to a new, difficult, but essential confrontation with reality. When I'm gone, so I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. There's no place in this world where I'll belong when I'm gone. And I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. And you won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it Guess I'll have to do it While I'm here